Let's talk about bacterial diseases. Now, some of these bacterial diseases you're not likely to encounter in the workplace, but you could encounter them on certification exams. You know, we're not going hardcore epidemiology here, we're just giving you uh, some general basic knowledge about some of these bacterial diseases. For some of them we'll go in a little more detail, but for most for the most part, it's just going to be a very superficial coverage of the bacterial diseases. Again, all of our organ systems are um, susceptible to bacterial infection. Uh, there are some bacteria, you know, bacteria will focus on different organ systems, but all of our organ systems can be affected by different bacteria. Remember, most bacteria uh, play, uh, have a positive uh, function in the ecosystem. You get, like I said before, all of them have a function of the ecosystem, but many of them, most of them, have a positive function of the ecosystem. So let's just go ahead and get started. Let's talk about... I think I should get into slideshow mode before I do this. Let's see. There we go. That's better. So let's go ahead and talk about the first bacterial disease that you're not likely to... <laughs> You're not likely to encounter this in the workplace. Uh, and it's not the band anthrax, it's the disease anthrax. Um, this does show up occasionally as, a, as the topic, as a question topic on certification exams. Um, the disease will have slightly different symptoms depending on the route of exposure. If it's uh, if it's a cutaneous exposure, a skin exposure, you may develop the cutaneous form of anthrax that we see here in the photo. Anthrax is also one of those biological agents that has been weaponized. It can be used as a weapon, which brings up the subject of bioterrorism and bioterrorism preparedness in our workplaces. And we could do a whole 30 minutes hour lecture on or discussion on bioterrorism in the workplace. And we're not going to do that here, but that is something that you might need to to uh, take into consideration as a safety manager. Does your company have an emergency preparedness plan for dealing with bioterrorism incidents? Not likely to happen, uh, but every now and then in the news, we hear about a, a white powder that's found in the subway or a white powder that was mailed to the CEO of a, of a company. A lot of times that white powder is just, it's, it's going to be talcum powder, baby powder, but there are biological agents that uh, exist in the form of white powder. Anthrax is one of those, and there may be others as well. Uh, so bioterrorism, not not our focus here, but that might be uh, on your agenda as a safety manager to make sure your company has programs and policies in place and that workers have training. Uh, you know, what, what do they do if they find an envelope of white powder? What do they do if there's a suspicious package that's leaking liquids? Or what do they do if there's a package that has an odd smell? Or, you know, just different things that uh, some companies certainly would want to take into consideration. But let's go back to some of the characteristics of the disease, some information about the disease. It is carried by herbivorous animals, cows, sheep, animals that eat, that eat plants, transmitted to humans, exposed to infected animals. It's not transmitted from human to human. Vaccines do exist. There are antibiotic treatments. 
Uh, it can enter our bodies through inhalation, ingestion, and breaks in the skin or through injection. Again, serious skin infection can, uh, can occur, and that's what I was mentioning earlier when I mentioned cutaneous anthrax. Another disease you're probably not going to have to deal with but does show up on certification exams is brucellosis or Bangs disease. Uh, it's a bacterial disease as all of those, all of the diseases we're going to talk about in this video are bacterial diseases. Transmitted to humans through the ingestion of unpasteurized milk products and the meat of infected animals. It's a disease that uh, when we, we hear about brucellosis it's usually cattle usually cows that are infected um, it's it can affect other animals as well but it's usually cows that we're talking about uh, no effective vac vaccine for use on humans again disease that can be transmitted to humans legionnaires disease again also very rare uh, but it's it uh, I think maybe of the three that we've talked about so far, anthrax, uh, brucellosis, and legionnaires, this is the disease most likely to show up on a certification exam. It was discovered uh, in 1976. There was an American Legion convention in Philadelphia. 34 of the participants, 34 of the attendees at this convention uh, became ill and died from a mystery disease. They didn't know what it was at the time. Uh, eventually, epidemiologists were able to link the illnesses and the fatalities to a specific bacteria, Legionella pneumophila. Uh, this bacteria tends to be found in uh, stagnant water, stagnant water that might be a part of an air conditioning system, um, you know, catch pans underneath the air conditioning system uh, that, uh, you know, captures the water, the water becomes stagnant. But the, the bacteria living in this water is not a problem until it's dispersed in some way, until it becomes aerosolized and dispersed and in HVAC systems it can be aerosolized and dispersed through the HVAC systems fans through the fans that are moving the air through the system and that's what is uh, thought to have happened in 76 in Philadelphia at the American Legion convention it's called Legionnaires disease because it was first discovered uh, as a result of this incident because of the of the the American Legion members who were affected by the disease uh, occasional outbreak outbreaks still occur but it like I said it's first discovered in Philadelphia but chances are according to to what I've read this is it probably wasn't a new bacteria it wasn't a new disease but it was the first time that it was discovered. There had probably been similar outbreaks in previous years that had gone undetected. Nobody, I think probably what got it detected here was the, the number of people who died from the illness. And many, many more people became sick because of their exposure to this bacteria. There is a real interesting video. Uh, uh, it's a forensic files video. Uh, and it talks about the Legionnaires outbreak in Philadelphia. It's only about 18 minutes long. It's in the index uh, of video links that I provide or of links that I provide. You might want to check it out. It's interesting. If you haven't heard about Legionnaires disease before, um, it, it's worth taking a look at. Uh, you'll also see on uh, television documentaries occasionally, there'll be a show that has a segment on, the, on Legionnaires disease and what happened in 1976 at the American Legion Conference in Philadelphia. Leptospirosis also can show up on certification exams, probably not going to be a problem uh, for safety management. I, I like to talk about leptospirosis uh, not just because it can show up on certification exams, but because it is a urine-borne illness. 
It is a bacterial disease that affects the liver, kidney, and lungs. It's transmitted when humans come into contact with urine from several different animals or they come into contact with soil that has been contaminated by urine. Uh, this bacteria can live in the soil for several months. You know, a cow pees on the ground. Uh, if there's uh, the Leptospira bacteria in their urine, it can live in that ground for several months. It enters the body through skin or mucous membranes. Uh, again, mucous membranes, we're talking about eyes, nose, or mouth and also breaks in the skin. And here is a, a diagram from the CDC that shows how humans can get infected. And it shows uh, the leptospira bacteria in the water. It could be in the water. I don't mention this over here. It could be in the soil. It could be direct contact with the, uh, the leptospira in the, in the urine. And uh, Again, very, very rare disease. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm guessing there's less than 100 cases each year in the United States of this particular disease. But it does show up on exams, and it is interesting because it's, it's one of the urine-borne diseases that are out there. Also, drinking contaminated water also can be a, uh, a uh, source or a way that the disease is transmitted. And if you look at other countries around the world, I, I alluded to this in an earlier video, countries that don't have uh, water sanitation systems like we have, you're more likely to see this disease and other waterborne diseases in those countries. Which brings up another issue, not really related to leptospirosis, but uh, a study I read a few years ago, uh, in the study, they examined contaminants that were found on canned foods. You know, canned drinks, like a can of Diet Pepsi, or maybe a can of green beans, or a can of chili. What the researchers did, they went into a warehouse, and they took samples of the contaminants off of the cans. I think they went into a lot of different locations, not just uh, one warehouse, but warehouse, retail stores, and they took samples of contaminants that were on the tops of the cans. And they found that there were are some pretty nasty contaminants on the tops of our food cans. Um, a takeaway from this, uh, not necessarily just workplace related, but uh, our lives in general related, Anytime you open a can of food, a can of uh, a drink can, something that you're going to consume, it might be a good idea to wash the top of that can, disinfect the top of that can before using the can opener on it. Also, every now and then, it's probably a good idea to disinfect your can opener that you're using to open these cans because there, there can be some nasty contaminants. There, you know, maybe there was a rat that peed on the, the Diet Pepsi can. You're, you know, you're drinking your Diet Pepsi, you didn't clean off the top of it, and you know, for all you know, there was a rat that peed on it, a rat that uh, was carrying the Leptospira bacteria. So, something to think about. Not, some of you may be grossed out, or freaked out a little bit by that. Don't be, but just uh, it, moving forward, you'll take that as a word of caution. There can be bad stuff uh, on, on the cans of food and drink that we consume. Another very rare disease that likes to show up in certification exam is the plague. Uh, commonly found in rodents, and it's caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria. There are several types of the plague, including the bubonic plague. You know, that was the disease that caused all the problems back in the Middle Ages. Killed about 20 million people in the Middle Ages, which that was a big chunk of the world population in the Middle Ages. But in, in addition to the bubonic plague, there's also a meningeal plague and septicemic plague. Uh, the, all forms of these plagues still occur, even the bubonic plague. Uh, there was a case in California a few years ago. But let's talk about transmission to humans first. Uh, coughing or sneezing, there can be airborne transmission. 
uh, there can be direct contact with an infected person that will allow the bacteria to be transmitted, contact with contaminated soil, contact with infected feces, and it can be vector-borne. Let's say a, a rodent uh, has the disease, a flea bites the rodent, and then the flea bites a human. So it goes from the rodent to the flea to the human, which, you know, that's a pretty complex train of trans, uh, a chain of transmission, but it can happen that way. Uh, and a lot of the, the problems in the Middle Ages were due to, at least as I, as I understand, was due to uh, poor sanitation, allowing a, a uh, very large rodent population to exist, and it went from rodent to flea to human. And that wasn't necessarily the rodents passing it directly to the humans, but there was that, there was the, uh, the, uh, that middle step where the flea would become infected and then infect the human. Again, still exists with periodic outbreaks, patient diagnosed in California in 2020. Uh, it can be effectively treated with modern antibiotics, antibiotics that they didn't have in the Middle Ages. We do have the we do have the weapons to, to control uh, the plague when it occurs. It's still it's still highly communicable. It still can be transmitted when it does occur. Uh, containment needs to take place when a case is identified. But contain that case, get the affected person the proper antibiotics, proper medications they need, and it it's not likely to become a serious problem in uh, in the 21st century. There is a video on the bubonic plague from the National Geographic Society. If you want to take a look at it, it's in the index. Now we're getting into a bacterial disease that is much more relevant to uh, work-related safety, tetanus. Uh, bacterial disease, Clostridium tetani, is the bacteria. One of the symptoms is a painful tightening of muscles. That's why it's often referred to as lock, lock jaw. Uh, but it's not just the jaw muscles that lock up. It's, it can be an entire, uh, uh, it can be all the muscles of your body that spasm and tighten and lock up. It's fatal in about 10% of cases. So this is a re one reason to pay attention to it. Uh, it's found in soil and the gastrointestinal tract of animals. As far as transmission to humans, usually enters through a break in the skin. As far as prevention, gloves, shoes, basic protective clothing when working in the soil. There is also a tetanus vaccination available. And uh, there should be a booster shot periodically, a booster tetanus vaccination periodically. Uh, my doctor says every five years. I get one every five years. Now other medical professionals may say every three or every seven, but according to my physician, every five years, and that's the that's the rotation I'm on. Every five years, I'll get a tetanus booster. Uh, because you know we all have gardening work like the like the folks over here in the picture. Um, when we are down in the dirt, there's a potential to come into contact with this bacteria that causes tetanus. Uh, wound covering is also important. If you know gloves may be enough, but let's say you have a have an open sore on your hand and you're going to be doing some gardening work, cover that wound with a bandage, wear gloves over that, you should be fine. Also, housekeeping is important. Puncture wounds can be a means by which the uh, the bacteria enters the body. A rusty nail in the yard or on the job site puncture someone's foot on that rusty nail is the tetanus bacteria resulting in a case of tetanus see what it seemed like there's something else i need to say about this i'm forgetting oh uh, as far as industries where where uh, it's most likely to occur it would be agriculture construction forestry those industries that are outdoor industries where there is soil contact uh, contact with animals as well perhaps uh, any industry where there's contact with animals because it is found in the gastrointestinal tract of animals um, 
uh, in slaughterhouses, the meat processing industry, chicken processing industries, um, uh, might be another uh, another industry area with greater exposure potential. But the great news here is the tetanus uh, vaccine does exist. Tetanus vaccines. That's what we push to our workers, uh, regardless of industry, regardless of whether it's manufacturing or medical or, or construction. Uh, you should, as a safety manager, we're not doctors, we're not prescribing anything, but recommend that they, they keep up to date with their tetanus vaccinations and receive a periodic booster. Uh, another thing when it comes to workplace tetanus, let's say you have a worker who is, uh, maybe they get a puncture wound, maybe they step on a nail and that nail punctures their foot, and they go to the clinic, you haven't checked out, you want to make sure everything's okay, uh, if the clinic administers a tetanus shot, that does not make the injury recordable. If a worker has a skin injury requiring a tetanus shot, the tetanus shot does not alone make the injury OSHA recordable. Tetanus shots are considered first aid by OSHA. Uh, you know, I ran into a project manager at Kiwit. We had an employee who, uh, who had a, uh, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a minor cut, it was, uh, I mean, it didn't require stitches, but it was more than just a minor cut. And I go, I suggest, well, why don't we send them in for a tetanus shot? Uh, they don't need stitches or anything, but let's get them a tetanus shot because they hadn't had a tetanus shot update or a booster recently. And the project manager balked at that because he was afraid that the tetanus shot would make it a recordable injury. And I had to pull out the regulations and show him that, no, tetanus is okay. A tetanus shot is, is considered first aid treatment. It's not going to be a recordable injury. So he ended up getting a tetanus shot. And you know, Kiwit's real big, and as, as are a lot of companies, they want to avoid recordable injuries. They don't want a recordable injury on their OSHA 300 log. So they will sometimes go too far, I think, in trying to uh, prevent uh, recordable injuries. And if it hadn't been for me, the guy wouldn't have got a tetanus shot. Which, and who knows, it could have, uh, it could have became a case of tetanus if he had not got the tetanus shot. Again, here's a, if you're not familiar with the concept of recordable injury, and some of you aren't, this might be your first safety class. If you're not uh, familiar with the concept of a recordable injury, uh, we have recordable injuries, and then we have non-recordable or first aid injuries. A recordable injury, it is an OSHA thing, and that's covered in 29 CFR 1904. It's an injury requiring medical care from a medical professional. Also, prescription medications will make it a recordable injury. If the worker has to miss work or they're, they're placed on restricted duty, they can't perform their normal job, that makes it a recordable. Or it could be as simple as a diagnosis of a significant work-related injury. Uh, there doesn't have to be any treatment. There doesn't have to be any x-rays or any of that. If it's a significant work-related illness, such as lung cancer or silicosis, that's diagnosed by a medical professional, then it's a recordable injury. But simple first aid, including a tetanus shot, even if that first aid is provided by a medical professional, is not a recordable. And again, I do encourage you, get some of my scribbles off here so let me scribble on it better i encourage all of you to learn more about 29 cfr 1904 those are the record keeping and reporting standards that companies have to follow uh, tuberculosis another uh, bacterial disease mycobacterium tuberculosis is the the Latin uh, name for the bacteria. It affects the lungs primarily, but also other organs can be affected by tuberculosis, including the, the central nervous system and the kidneys. Uh, there can be an asymptomatic infection, a latent infection, meaning someone can be infected and not know it. They could be communicate, uh, not, or not communicating, transmitting that disease to others even though uh, they don't have any symptoms. As far as transmission to humans, human to human, airborne, is primary is the primary uh, means of transmission. 
preventing the disease, quarantine of infected individuals. Now, the more modern term for quarantine is containment. Containment of that individual to prevent contact with others. Masks to contain the bacterium to the infected individual. Uh, there are vaccinations available, but they're only effective when administered to infants and children. They're not effective with adults. There are effective treatments for tuberculosis. This is one area of medicine where we've come a long way over the years. 100 years ago, tuberculosis was a, was a uh, death sentence. It may be a, a long drawn out process uh, before the person died, but it was a death sentence. There weren't treatments available. And one of the ways of containing tuberculosis pay, patients, say 100 years ago, was uh, sending them to a tuberculosis facility. It was basically a, an encampment for tuberculosis patients. Uh, somebody's got tuberculosis, well you send them off to the tuberculosis uh, hospital and they would uh, stay there for the rest of their life basically. Uh, see, what else can I say? Uh, it's relatively rare in the US but it has kind of made a comeback. Uh, there was a significant outbreak on a reservation in the southwest a few years ago and that's what this video is about is tuberculosis, tuberculosis among the Navajo uh, from a few years ago. It is a much wider spread uh, uh, more common disease in other parts of the world. In developed countries of the world like the US it's uh, becoming more common again but it's not nearly as common uh, in developed countries as it is in the underdeveloped countries of the world. All right. Tularemia, rabbit fever. F Francisella tularensis is the bacteria found in rabbits. Uh, this is maybe timely. Some of you guys may be rabbit hunters. If, you, if, you're, if you're shooting rabbits and you're eating your rabbits, make sure they're cooked well because you could be setting yourself up for a bout of tularemia. Symptoms uh, usually include some type of ulceration at a contact point, can affect skin, lungs, eyes, can be fatal. Transmission to humans, tick and deer fly bites, skin contact with infected animals, eating an infected animal would also be a problem, drinking contaminated water, inhaling contaminated aerosols or agricultural and landscaping dust. And I do want to mention a case a few years ago and that's why I have the lawnmower over here. There was a case a few years ago where a, a, a gardener uh, developed tularemia and they think he had, he had ran over a dead uh, rabbit or other rodent. This can be other rodents also. Rabbits are especially uh, susceptible. Let's say he ran over a, a, a dead rabbit that was infected and that put all this crap up in the air that he inhaled and he developed tularemia as a result of that. Prevention. Uh, it can also be transmitted by ticks and flies. Uh, it's not just contact with rabbits. Ticks and flies can be carriers. So using an insect repellent can be beneficial. Wearing gloves when handling sick or dead animals. Avoid mowing over dead animals and you should be okay. Uh, and very rare disease, uh, but it's, it's another one of those uh, disorders that does show up occasionally on certification exams. And it's kind of interesting, trivial types of, type of knowledge that, that's uh, fun to think about. Uh, for, for those of you who are deer, or not deer hunters, rabbit hunters, you probably don't have anything to worry about, but don't be eating raw rabbit. Make sure it's, it's thoroughly cooked before it's consumed. All right, that brings us to the end of, of this video. When we come back, we're going to talk about some more bacterial diseases. We're going to do bacterial diseases in two parts.